Let's turn in the Holy Scriptures now to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter 3. The sermon, as you know, will be a be a sermon on the theme text for family visitation this year. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But we'll begin reading at verse 1 of 2 Peter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts today and in this week and in the next several weeks as we conduct family visitation in our congregation. Our text is that last verse of 2 Peter 3. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's Peter's word to the beloved. 
And that's God's word to us as the beloved in Jesus Christ. You will see in this chapter how at least four times the apostle addresses those who he's writing to as beloved. Verse 1, verse 8, verse 14, and verse 17. And that is how the word of God comes to us as those who are beloved by God for Christ's sake. Throughout his letter, this second letter, Peter is emphasizing to the people of God the need for correct spiritual knowledge of God's truth. He speaks repeatedly of the importance of grasping the truth through a careful study of the scriptures. Already in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In verse 3, he says that God's divine power, which is his grace, has given unto us as God's church all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of of him, and that's the knowledge of God who has called us to glory and virtue. In chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, the apostle teaches that that knowledge that the church is to have of God and of Christ and of spiritual things comes out of the word of God, the more sure word of prophecy that is a light that shines to God's people who are always in a dark place, in the darkness of a fallen world of sin and of sinners and who in themselves have darkness in their old nature. The apostle takes up that theme of knowledge in the beginning of chapter 3 as well, where his, where his Last word, as it were, to the beloved is, I'm stirring you up, I stir up, I I excite your minds to remember these things. Remember the words of the Old Testament of the prophets, the holy prophets, and the word that the apostles of Christ have brought to you as the church of God. And the apostle emphasizes knowledge for the church because a balanced grasp of the truth equips us as Christians for any danger that we might face in this present world. A balanced grasp of the truth. In other words, the right knowledge of grace and of our Lord Jesus Christ and his promises protects us from being led away by the error of the wicked as Peter calls the false philosophies and doctrines of the world in verse 17, the heir of the wicked, and provides strength lest we fall from our own steadfastness. And Peter isn't there saying that we have to be careful because it's possible for us to lose our salvation in Christ. That's not possible. But Peter is saying it is possible if You are not diligent in learning and in reminding yourself of the truth of Christ to become imbalanced and to become shaky in your confidence of faith in the truth of God's word and in your practice of that word in your Christian life. When the scoffers come and they say, where's the promise of God's coming? And you have not been in the scriptures and you have not been reminding yourself of the things that the holy prophets and the apostles have spoken. You are in a dangerous spiritual place. Every false doctrine and errant practice that has taken place before can be withstood and spoken against by the same word of God that Peter says is the light that shines in a dark place. 
And as we begin another season of family visitation, we as a consistory and as a congregation are reminded to grow spiritually. In other words, never to rest on what we already know, never to think that we have arrived, that we have nothing more to learn, that we have no need to remind ourselves of these things because we know them already. And it is very appropriate that, the, that our church order in Article 23, where it, where it lays down the, the calling of the elders and the pastor to conduct family visitation, says that this is to be done for the edification of the churches, for the building up of the congregation and the families and individual believers in the knowledge and truth of God's word. Therefore, the word of God to us is grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The desire to grow in grace is present when there is fervent knowledge, fervent love, and knowledge of Christ. When we love him, then we want to know him and more and more, better and better, as in any close relationship, particularly in marriage, when there is fervent love between husband and wife, marriage is a lifelong study and practice in getting to know one's spouse as one's best friend and to grow in knowledge and in love for one's spouse. So it is with the church and Jesus Christ. And so our calling from this text and in family visitation this season is grow in grace unto God's glory. Or as it, was, as it is in the bulletin, the reformed believer's spiritual growth. Grow in grace to God's glory. We want to know first what this means. What this means. Secondly, the means by which we grow in grace to God's glory, and finally, the aim. So the meaning, what it means to grow in grace, the means, how God accomplishes it in us, and the aim, which is the glory of God. To grow in grace implies spiritual life. The word grow that the apostle uses means to augment or to increase or to cause to grow. The ability to grow implies the presence of life. Something that is dead cannot grow. Something that is in poor health cannot grow well. And so the question is, are you alive? Not are you alive physically, you're all here, but are you alive spiritually unto Jesus Christ? Do you believe in him? Does he live in you through his spirit? Have you trusted in him for your salvation? Life is required for growth. Even as the physically dead cannot grow, there can be no growth of the spiritually dead. But as Christians, and these are those whom Peter addresses as beloved, as the beloved Christians of God, we have been given spiritual life. God implants that life in seed form, and then he causes that seed to begin to grow, and to grow through the whole length of our physical life on earth, from the moment that we are reborn, to the moment that we pass into the life to come, God causes the seed of new life, spiritual life, to grow in us. Within that seed, there is the possibility of growth and development, even as the seed that you may plant of a flower or of a vegetable has within it the potential to grow and to develop. So the seed of new life that God plants in our hearts can grow and can develop and mature. 
Peter is writing to young Christians who had been given the gift of spiritual life. The gift of this spiritual life, he tells them, came through God's gift of regeneration, the new birth and the birth from above. He says that in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter 1 verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, been given, like precious faith, new life with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that seed life of regeneration and of faith had sprouted in them, and they were conscious of it. In other words, as they had grown and matured physically and mentally, they came to consciously know that God had given the precious gift of faith to them, that they had a living bond with the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter says in, in chapter 1, verse 4, that they were made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When they were given faith, they came to know the heart of God as it was revealed in his promises and were separated from the wicked world. In verse 5 of chapter 1, Peter says that they were able, were these believers and this is true of all believers, to add to their faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity. Because they were in Christ, and being in Christ, they brought forth these fruits of faith in Jesus and in so doing made their calling and election sure. Chapter 1, verse 10. Now Peter says, grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or to put it another way, having entered into the school of learning who Jesus is, Understand that you are here for the long haul. There's no diploma in the school of Christ. You do not graduate from growing in grace and in the knowledge of Christ in this life before you've entered into the life to come. And even in the life to come, we will enter more deeply into the riches of God's grace in Christ. So what is this grace, then, that we are called to grow in? Grace usually refers to God's undeserved attitude of favor towards those who are undeserving. God's attitude of favor towards those who are undeserving by which God makes them beautiful with his own holy beauty. That's what grace usually refers to. Here, the emphasis is on grace as the virtues of, that God's grace gives to us. In other words, God's powerful and undeserved attitude of favor for us as his beloved people always gives. That's true from chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where Peter says, grace is and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, God's grace, his undeserved favor towards those who are undeserving, gives always all things that pertain unto life and godliness. God's Grace chiefly gives the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. Free salvation from every punishment that is due to us for our sins and all of our sinfulness. And God's grace bestows on us 
righteousness by accounting Jesus' righteousness to us and then imparting the righteousness of life. In other words, God accounts the righteousness of Christ to us in justification and then continues to work in us graciously so that we live righteously according to that declaration that is sanctification. This is the complete gift of gracious salvation. And then under the umbrella of that gift of gracious salvation in Christ, God gives hope and the forgiveness of sins and love and humility and contentment. Every good gift in one in us who receive God's grace is grace. Every good gift we receive is a gift of grace. So when Peter says to us, grow in grace, when by inspiration he gives that calling to the church, he is saying that we who are alive in Christ must develop and strengthen these virtues, these gifts of grace. He does that in chapter 1, verse 5, where he says, Give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and so forth. And where he says in chapter 3, verse 14, Give, be diligent that ye may be found of God in peace without spot and blameless. Develop and strengthen the virtues of grace. Grow in the awareness of them and strive, fight, work consciously to develop them in your lives. To put it another way, we're called here to reflect Jesus more and more. To reflect Jesus better and better, to more and more reveal him in our life to the glory of God in his joy and his love and his peace and his gentleness and his goodness and meekness and self-control. Peter's call, calling us here by the inspiration of the Spirit to grow in faith. In other words, to grow in our knowledge of the teaching of Scripture with more firmness to hold for truth all that God has taught us in his word and not stagger. In other words, not to believe or not to think that the promises of God aren't great enough to reach a sinner as great as we. To grow in grace is to grow in the gift of justification. In other words, to rest more and more completely in the finished work of Jesus. To grow in hope is to look more and more for the coming of Jesus, as Peter calls the church to do in chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be as you look for and haste unto or expect the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? And finally, to grow in, the gra to grow in grace is to grow in love, which means that we more and more dwell on the love of God for us in order that his love may extend through us in our thoughts and words and deeds. Grow in grace. Now how does God accomplish that in our lives? Well here we come to the second point, the means so we've seen what it means to grow in grace. Now, how does God accomplish that? Well, God is pleased to accomplish his will 
that we grow in grace by the use of means. Means is some tool in this world that God uses to accomplish a spiritual purpose. And now let's move to what the means God is pleased to use are to grow us in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We can do that by looking at the Canons of Dort in Heads 3 and 4, Article 17. The Canons here help us understand how it is that God accomplishes His will that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can find Canons 3 and 4, Article 17 on page 70 in the back of the Psalter. And there, the Reformed Church in ages gone by writes for our instruction this, the almighty operation of God whereby he prolongs and supports our natural or our physical life does not exclude but requires the use of means by which God of his infinite mercy and goodness has chosen to exert his influence. So also the supernatural operation of God by which we are regenerated in no way excludes or subverts the use of the gospel, which gospel the most wise God has ordained to be the seed of regeneration and food of the soul. Wherefore, as the apostles and teachers who succeeded them piously instructed the people concerning this grace of God to his glory and the abasement of all pride, and in the meantime, did not neglect to keep them by the sacred precepts of the gospel in the exercise of the word, sacraments, and discipline, so even to this day, be it far from either instructors or instructed to presume to tempt God in the church by separating what he of his good pleasure has most intimately joined together. For grace is conferred by means of admonitions. And the more readily we perform our duty, the more imminent usually is this blessing of God working in us, and the more directly is his work advanced, to whom alone all the glory both of means and of their saving fruit and efficacy is forever due. Amen. Now we will work through, we will use that as the template as we work through this second point dealing with the means that God uses to accomplish his will, causing us to grow in grace and in knowledge. Let's notice first that the apostle says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the way to grow in grace, is the means that God uses to grow us in grace. The knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that knowledge is an intellectual knowledge. It is, in other words, knowing what the Bible teaches about Jesus, about who he is, and about the work that he came to this earth to accomplish for us and the work that he is now doing in us as our ascended Lord and Savior to preserve us as his people. We are to study, therefore, and learn, as it were, the topsoil of the truth, the history of Jesus' birth and life and death, his parables and miracles. But we also need to get below the surface into the depths to see clearly that the truths of Scripture center around Christ seeing the truth of being united to Christ as the source of all of our blessing in this world and in the life to come, to see God's sovereign purposes and control of all things, 
for his glory through Jesus, to see God's absolutely perfect wisdom in ordaining the fall of man into sin in order to open the way for sending Christ to save his people from their sins. The faithfulness of God to his promise to send Jesus and his holy justice in satisfy, in, in laying on Christ the punishment that we deserved and God's everlasting love in giving his only begotten son to the death of the cross. We have to know these things from the scriptures and understand them and be reminded of them. As Peter says, I stir you up. I want to excite you to, be, to remember the truths of Christ. But intellectual knowledge without spiritual knowledge leads only to pride. And the knowledge that Peter is speaking of here is a knowledge of love. It is isn't a knowledge only about Christ, that he was born, that he lived, that he died, and why he lit, was born and lived and died. That's not enough. To know that is only to become puffed up. That we know something that others do not. We must know Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's how Peter speaks of him in verse 18. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It must be spiritual knowledge of Christ. The right grasp of the truth that God has revealed to us about Jesus and grace and salvation leads to humility in those who understand that Christ needed to come and die and rise again for their salvation. This is the knowledge of Christ that comforts our hearts and edifies our faith and others. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the knowledge of him is the means that God uses to cause us to grow in grace. Now, how do we acquire that knowledge? How does God speak and apply that knowledge to us? The Canons of Dort had three and four, Article 17 that we read says, God uses the gospel which he has ordained to be the seed of regeneration and the food of our souls and the heart of the gospel is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done. And the canons here make a very plain illustration that even children can understand. It is God's pleasure, it's God's will to keep us alive physically by using food and water that's why we have to eat every day. That's why we have to drink water every day. Because God has, is pleased to use food and water to keep us alive physically, to keep our bodies alive and healthy and strong. God could keep us alive without food and water. But he is pleased to use food and water to keep us physically alive and healthy. And if we neglect food and water, if we say, I don't need food and water, I can get by so many hours or so many days without those things, we will quickly find that we cannot survive and that we, or that at least that we cannot function as we need to function in order to carry out our calling and work in this world. So God is pleased to use the means of the gospel as the food of our souls. And that gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God works in us by that gospel 
to grow us in grace in three ways. The first is to push us off the pedestal of self-reliance. In other words, to remind us through that gospel that we have no strength and resources in ourselves to grow in grace or to receive grace or to earn grace or to continue in grace. When the gospel comes to us, it says, you are not able. You have no resources in yourself. to save or continue in salvation from sin. The gospel says you do not have it. You do not, cannot handle this on your own. The gospel says to us you cannot try to live a better life or to be better people or find within yourselves the resources you need for goodness and happiness in this world. But the gospel comes and pushes us off that pedestal of self-trust, shows us our insufficiencies, shows us our need, and directs us to Christ and his suffering alone. The gospel shows us that our peace in the present and our blessedness in the future is not found in ourselves or anything we do, but in Jesus alone. That's what we need to know in order to understand our need for grace that we are not able in ourselves to secure our own peace in the present or our blessedness in the future. The second thing the gospel does is to renew or to renovate our minds and wills and affections and desires into the image and likeness of God. Now, you understand that when we are alive spiritually, when God has performed his wonder work in us of saving us from our, of giving us new life, we are always alive spiritually forever after. It's not that every day we have to be re- re- resurrected, as it were. Once God has given us spiritual life, we always have that spiritual life. But our will and our mind and our desires need to be called every day and called every week, need to be stirred up and reminded of the knowledge of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, God transforms us through the gospel daily and weekly to apply our hearts by the Spirit to His Word and to living as holy people in this world. Transformation through the gospel happens when the truth of the gospel comes into our hearts with clarity and efficacy and light and heat and passion and the fire of the Holy Spirit and of the Holy God and of the Holy Christ who sends it. That happens through the gospel, through the preaching of the gospel, and through the reading of the word of God. And third, the gospel is used by God who accomplish his purpose of growing us in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by engaging our whole soul to live unto God in obedience. The response to God's gospel of grace is to live according to that gospel. In other words, worship. Worshiping God is the only right response to the mercies of God. Romans 12 verse 1 says that offering our bodies and souls to God is our reasonable service or our right reasonable response to the mercies of God in Christ. Christ. 
When the gospel does its work in our hearts, worship is not only our duty, it is, and the canon speak of that, the more readily we perform our duty, but it's more than a duty. It is a delight. It is, if you will, the reflex reaction of one who is alive in Christ and alive unto God, who hears the gospel, says, I want to worship the God who speaks that gospel to me and the Christ who, who, who lived and who died and who now applies that gospel to my heart through his spirit. And I want to obey the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and submit myself to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So to sum up, it is God's good pleasure to use the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the gospel to give us grace to grow in grace by being satisfied in Christ, renovating our souls, and engaging us in worship. In other words, every time we encounter the drama of redemption in the pages of the Bible, in the preaching of the gospel, in the Lord's table, in the sacrament of baptism, or some experience in which God impresses on our hearts the truth of the gospel in a, in a deep and new way we should be moved to grow in grace by resting more deeply in Christ, by desiring greater likeness to Christ, and more vibrant worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we've alluded to it already, but now applying that very practically. What does that require of us? How does God accomplish that? Through the weekly preaching of his word and our attentive receiving of that word and through our regular reading, discussion of, meditation on, praying over the Word of God in our homes as individuals and with our families. And family visitation is a time in which we as believers in response to questions or encouragement from our elders and from our pastor are able to testify to how the word of God is being used by Christ week to week and as we regularly use it in our homes to cause us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's why we are concerned as, as office bears about that in our homes and families. Because it is the word of God which imparts the knowledge of Christ and through which God is pleased to work, to water and to nourish and to feed our souls to grow in grace. We cannot expect to grow in grace if we do not diligently attend church and listen attentively or neglect the devotional use of the Bible and prayer in our homes throughout the week. And now I want to apply this specifically to family worship. It is necessary that we spend time alone with God and in our families worship him. 
This is the calling especially of those who are heads of household, those who are fathers or those who are in a position of authority in the home if the father is absent. It includes, does, this, does our worship of God by ourselves and with our families, prayer for God's blessing on the church and on our congregation in the present situation at this time, and the circumstances of our families and of every member of our families. It includes, does our personal and family worship of God, includes also the reading of the scripture and simple and clear explanations of the word of God to help children as well as ourselves understand what the word of God is saying to us and how it speaks to our family on a particular day in a particular situation and at the present time. After reading the scriptures, there's to be discussion to make use of what has been read to help our families grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, if a particular sin is warned against in the word of God that we have read for that day or at that time, then we are to talk as a family about how that sin may have affected us as individuals and as a family and how we can fight that sin in our home and in our family. Or if the word of God, the passage that we've read, requires a duty, gives us a calling, as our text does here, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. After we read that word of God, we have a discussion as a family about how we carry out that calling in our lives with one another. If there's a promise that is spoken, we speak as a family of how that promise comforts us, of how that promise speaks to our hearts and our personal struggles or battles and we apply that comfort to the other members of our family. This is how the word of God is used. This is how we encounter Christ in the gospel, not only every week in the preaching, but every day in our homes. And once again, the, as, the, as our fathers warned us or spoke to us, in, our, in Article 17 of Head 3 and 4 of the Canons, and as the illustration of the gospel as food reminds us, when we neglect the gospel on the pages of Scripture, when we neglect the application of that gospel to our lives and hearts as individuals and as families, then we need to hear that there's a real danger that we fall from our present steadfastness, as Peter puts it in, chapter, in verse 17, that we be, are led away with the air of the wicked, that we are liable to fall prey to the temptations of the world and the uh, false and unbiblical ideas that are thrown at us by those who mock the truth of God's word. So God is pleased to use his gospel as a means to give us grace to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The aim of this is not only our welfare as, as individuals and as, congregate, as, as families and as a congregation, 
but it is the glory of God in our individual and family and congregational lives. The glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When Peter speaks of the glory of God here, he's referring to the objective revelation of God's brilliance in all of his attributes and in all of his virtues. And that we, and we see that in the word of God and we experience that in our own lives as we enter more deeply into a knowledge and understanding of who God is and of what he has done for us in Jesus as he reveals it to us in the gospel. So our text ends with, a, with the aim of our whole life as believers. What every prayer we offer in our own closet and around our family dinner table, what every day needs to end with as we lay our head down on the pillow to, to hopefully receive God's gift of sleep and be strengthened for our labor and activities on the morrow. Lord, help me not to forget who you are and who I am, that you are worthy of all glory and all praise, and that I am and can do nothing for myself. That's where the canons of Dort in the article we read lead us to God alone all the glory both of means and of their saving fruit and, and efficacy is ever due. The glory of God is our calling as Christians. We are made by God for his glory and we are formed by him to enjoy him forever. The glory of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. When we know Jesus, and when we know the gospel of who he is and what he has done, we will glorify him both now and forever. With those last words, the word of God reminds us that already now we live as those who are made for a future glory. We live in this world now because God is working in us to prepare us for a future glory and that he will bring us to that glory in his time. And, where we will see, and there we will see him revealed in his glory in the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where the word of God, as we have it in the Bible, will no longer be necessary because we will see the Christ that the Bible reveals face to face. And we will enjoy fellowship with him, not as those who are separate from him now, but as those who are in his presence and will continue there forever. This is the aim of growing in grace, that we might be preserved as God's people in this world, that we might not be led away with the error of the wicked or fall from our own steadfastness, but that we might continue faithful to God in our personal walk with him in our homes and as a congregation until the coming of Christ. Let us pray for the grace to grow in grace to the glory of God as we practice our family visits, as we anticipate those visits, and then as we reflect on them so that God may be glorified in our midst. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, give us grace to grow in grace. Help us to be more aware of the gifts of thy grace thou hast given to us, more diligent to practice them,
use the means of the gospel this afternoon as it has been explained and set forth from thy word, as Christ has been set forth among us. To push us off the platform of our self-confidence and self-righteousness. To transform us more and more into the image of Christ and to stir in us worship. We pray that thou wilt use thy word and prayer in our individual lives and in our families this week to give us the strength every day to walk in faithfulness with thee, in love, in hope of the certain coming of Jesus and the perfection of our salvation. And not to be led away with the air of the wicked and our confidence shaken. We pray all of this, Father, not that we might be exalted, but because we desire thy glory as the God of our salvation, as the one who sent our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into the world and saved us through him, and who even now is with us by thy Spirit, works these prayers in us, and will be with us in this week, to defend, protect, and preserve us. To thy name be all glory, both now and forever. Amen.